Thinking aloud. Conversations on the leading edge of knowledge and discovery with psychologist Jeffrey Mishlove. Hello and welcome. I'm Jeffrey Mishlove. Today, we will be reflecting on the near-death experience. My guest is Elizabeth Crone. She is co-author with Professor Jeffrey Kripal of the book Changed in a Flash, One Woman's Near-Death Experience and Why a Scholar Thinks It Empowers Us All. I have actually interviewed both Elizabeth and Jeffrey Kripal previously on this topic, and right now I am linking to both of those interviews. You may want to watch them first. It might help, uh, or you might want to watch them later. This particular interview was recorded on December 5th, 2021 in a hotel room in Las Vegas. It occurred on the morning after the Bigelow Institute Awards ceremony where I received the Grand Prize Award and Elizabeth also received a very substantial award for her essay. And now I'll switch over to that video. Let's start by reflecting once again on uh, the experience you had 33 years ago when you were struck by lightning, because some of our viewers will not have seen the uh, original. 33 years ago, I, well, here you go, I was 28 years old, and so anybody can do the math. Um, I was going to my synagogue for services <clears throat> with my four-year-old and my two-year-old. And we got there. I We were kind of in a hurry because we were late for services. My husband at the time was out of town on business. So it was just me and the two boys. And when we pulled in the parking lot, suddenly out of nowhere on a bright sunny day, there was this massive... <laughs> cloud and horrible sheets of rain and lightning. I mean, it was out of nowhere. I mean, even past it, I could see that it was sunny. It, it was just right over the synagogue, basically. And so I parked, and because services had already started, um, and we were there for the reading of my grandfather's name on the anniversary of first anniversary of his death. I didn't want to wait in the car for the rain to stop because I didn't want to miss the reading of his name. So I told my four-year-old to run ahead to the awning at the building and to wait. <clears throat> and he did. I saw him make it there safely. I climbed over the seat of the car, you know, 50 pounds ago, and I um, got my two-year-old out of the car seat and opened the car door, and with my left hand, I got an umbrella, and I got it, I held the shaft of the umbrella really high, and the metal of the shaft was touching my wedding ring, and I held my two-year-old's hand with my right hand. And after we had taken about three or four steps, um, I looked at my hand and I thought, this is not very bright. Uh, you know, uh, I shouldn't be carrying an umbrella. I need to let go of the umbrella because there was a lot of lightning. And it was almost like I beckoned it by thinking that because just as I thought, let go, a, a tiny, and I know this because someone told me later who had seen it, a tiny little tine of lightning off of a larger bolt just touched the tip of the umbrella. And it didn't knock me out, but it it paralyzed me. Like my arm and my hand, I couldn't let go. It was frozen, and I could not let go of the umbrella. And then a big bolt hit the umbrella. That definitely, uh, I, that was it. 
um, when that happened, my two-year-old started screaming because we later found out that it burst his eardrums and he was in a lot of pain. And it burst my eardrums, but I wasn't in any pain. Um, and the four-year-old ran back. He had seen it all happen and remembers it. The two-year-old even remembers it to this day. And anyway, he, and he's 35. So um, the four-year-old ran back out, got his brother, and started pulling him toward the building, and I followed them. And we got inside the building, and people started gathering around to see what had happened because they were screaming. Both boys were screaming. And nobody was talking to me. Everyone was ignoring me, and it was very disorienting. You know, I'm standing right here. Why aren't you talking to me? And I realized my umbrella was missing. And I looked back out the window in the door. We were in the lobby of the synagogue. And I looked out and I saw the umbrella. It was a skeleton, like a metal skeleton of the umbrella. And it was smoking, kind of. And I looked to the right of that, about 20 feet, and I saw myself on the ground. So, <laughs> very disconcerting, very disorienting, and um, <laughs> obviously nothing like that had ever happened to me before. And I, I mean, there are a lot of little details, but I went back out there and looked down at myself and I had a lot of thought. Well, my first thought was, well, damn, <laughs> this doesn't look good. <laughs> I don't know what's going on, but I think I'm dead. And a light appeared to my right and above me, and I followed it. And it led me to a, well, I call it a garden, but it was not like any garden I've ever seen here. Um, the, the colors were different. They, it was like from a different spectrum. I, I couldn't even tell you what colors they were. And um, the plants and the flowers were like exploding with color. It, it, they kept blossoming and color was just exploding. And there was a bench and a voice told me to sit on the bench. And it was the voice of my grandfather, whose name we had been there to hear read. Um, and I know it was, I mean, he had a very distinctive voice. He had a French accent and it was him. So, you know, when you're, when you're in a place you think is heaven and you think you're dead and uh, you, there's this gorgeous bench, more beautiful than any bench you've ever seen before. It was like, I don't know what kind of wood it was, but it was hand carved. And I mean, it felt like satin. It was swirls. It, it was just gorgeous. So when this voice tells you to sit and you're in this place, you sit, <laughs> you don't question it. So I sat down and he sat next to me and I never did turn to look at him. I, I was afraid of what I would see. Uh, so I, I do not believe it was my grandfather, though I do believe it was God. Um, and I think he was using my grandfather's voice to put me at ease and so I wouldn't be frightened. And I spent two weeks there talking. And as soon as I thought a question, I had the answer. Any topic, any any subject, any question, it, the information was there, I, and I had it. It was like an instantaneous download of information. And I know I was there for two weeks because there were three planets or moons or something that were moving. And I just instinctively knew how to read the movement of those planets 
And I understood the passage of time by the movement of the planets, which is kind of a ridiculous thing to say because actually time didn't exist there. And I've thought a lot about that. And I think the reason I say that I understood the passage of time on the one hand, and on the other hand, time isn't linear and it didn't even exist while I was there, is that I had to think of it in linear terms just to be able to decode the information. Um, and definitely, once I was back here, I definitely had to think of it in linear terms, or I wouldn't have gotten it. You know, I, I, I had to. Um, but that was one of the big, big lessons there, was the nonlinear nature of time. Mm -hmm. um, the biggest thing about where I was was the unconditional love that permeated everything it it wasn't just me but it was it was in the flowers it was in the grass it was in the bench it was everything was just emanating this this love that again i mean i have children and i know what unconditional love is i thought i knew it doesn't even come close to what i felt there and um, I was given a choice. I could stay there or come back. And I was given information to help me make my decision. And one of the things I was told was that if I did decide to come back, I would come back um, as a different person, basically. I, and I did. I, there, was very, there are very few similarities between who I am now and who I was the instant before that lightning struck me. Um, and that the change in me would cause my marriage to not survive. And, and that indeed did happen. We did get divorced, but it wasn't until nine years after my NDE that we got divorced. So I guess that what one might say then is that the changes evolved over time. It, it's not as if you were suddenly changed, but that now it's been 33 years, there have been right. a whole sequence of changes. Right. Well, yes, it was slow at first. Mm -hmm. It was very slow. Um, and I didn't talk about it. I didn't, I did not talk about what happened to me. Um, until about five years ago. But as changes in me started happening, and my husband was noticing these changes gradually, um, it was changing our relationship. And, uh, you know, it made me a, a different parent than I had been before. A better parent. <laughs> much better parent. You know, I thought, I thought before this happened, I thought I'm a good person. I'm a good person. I, you know, I follow the law. I, I fit in with society. I, you know, take care of my kids. Mm -hmm. But the word good took on a new meaning afterwards. I, it, um, it, it's very nuanced. It's, I don't know how to describe it. Good to me now is more of uh, a loving and caring and um, kind person. Not necessarily just, you know, you stop at red lights, but it's a kindness and it's a very internal thing. It's, I don't know that from the outside people would necessarily see a huge difference in me. But I sure do. I mean, I feel it. Well, one of the things I know is that one of your little boys has become a rabbi. Orthodox rabbi. Orthodox rabbi. Hasidic Orthodox rabbi. Which one? 
Which little boy? Yeah.、Uh, the two year old whose two-year-old. hand I was holding. Yes.、Mm-hmm. Do you、yeah. think that、uh, your experience that day、uh, in any way、uh, affected his decision? He would say no. I say yes. Because he wasn't raised.、Uh, we were very non religious. Family. I mean, I we rarely went to services unless there was a reason to go.、Um, very, you know, we I was raised Reform, which is like Judaism light,、mm-hmm. and、um, he just he wasn't raised that way. So I think that the whole experience, yes, I think it did something to cause him. He's always been a seeker, you know, always. Seeking something, and that led him down that path, which is,、uh, as you point out, a very intense path. Very, very intense, and it's been difficult for us because I, the whole experience made me less religious、mm-hmm. than I had been before, and I wasn't religious to begin with. So,、um, as I'm moving away from religion, my son is moving toward it. And I think right now we are both opposite extremes. I mean, he is a, his is very extreme. And I'm just not religious. Well, you, you described yourself, though, as a person who understands the meaning of goodness in a new way.、Mm-hmm. Which sounds, I, I would say, it sounds like you're saying you're moving toward being more spiritual. Definitely. Absolutely. And that took me a little while. You know, even after the near death experience, I was dealing with a lot of physical problems from the lightning.、Yeah. Okay. So I wasn't putting a whole lot of thought and energy into the fact that I had sat for two weeks with God and spoke to him and had all this information.、Uh, I just wanted the burns to go away. <laughs> And once I was feeling better and I started processing what had happened to me,、um, yeah, I, I did become much more spiritual pretty quickly. And that was a big turnoff for my ex husband、um, because he had never. Been a spiritual person. He basically had a secular life. Yeah. Occasional <laughs> visits to the synagogue. Exactly. And he was still like that,、mm-hmm. and I wasn't.、Mm-hmm. So it just didn't work. And, and obviously, this impacted your young child in some way. Right, right. And I had a third child.、Um, after my NDE, one of the things I was told was if I come back, Um, that I would have a third child and it would be a girl. And I did, and she is. And、um, so I had three children with him. And actually, we're friends. We both remarried. And、um, he has become much more spiritual because he's, life has dealt him some pretty severe blows. Recently, and well, not so recent, 10 years, and it's changed him more in the direction I've gone. One other episode that I know we've talked about previously, but it's worth repeating,、mm-hmm. is, is the telephone call you receive from this same grandfather who, yes. who was deceased. Yes. It was about a year and a half after my NDE. And it was about 3 30 in the morning, and we were sound asleep. And I was newly pregnant and exhausted, and had been chasing two little boys around all day. And the phone rang, and I was in a pretty deep sleep. And my husband woke me up. He was shaking me because the phone was on my side of the bed, it was a landline. So,、uh, The landline rang and he shook me and woke me up and said, Answer the phone. And I didn't want to answer it because I figured somebody's calling to give me bad news. Nobody's going to call me at 3 30 in the morning 
ask me how I'm doing, you know. Um, so I, I picked up the phone and I s- said hello. And it was my grandfather, with the French accent. And now my husband and I are both sitting up in bed and he's saying to me, who is it? Who is it? And I did not want to tell him who it was. Uh, I knew he would not handle it well. Um, not that who would have handled it well? Right, I mean, right, right. It would take a, a, a person, maybe like myself, a parapsychologist. Exactly, <laughs> exactly. And he is not a parapsychologist. He is a CPA. So You didn't want to tell your husband right. that your deceased grandfather was on the phone. I said to him, uh, to my grandfather, why are you calling me? <laughs> and he said... I need you to call your mother and tell her something for me. This was my mother's father. And I said, why don't you call her? (laughs) Clearly, you can do this. And he said, I've tried to reach her, and she can't hear me. And you can ever since the lightning struck you. And I said, well, where are you? And he said, well, you know where I am. You were here. And I said, is Grandma there? Because she died about a year after he did. I said, is Grandma there? And my husband said, who are you talking to? (laughs) And I, I kept shushing him. And my grandfather said, she is. She's here. And she's, uh, I've, she's doing well, which she, when she died, she had dementia and, that was very comforting to me to know that her memories were intact and um, that she was there. And I said, I need to tell you something. And he said, no, I already know you're pregnant and it's a girl like you were told it would be. And he said, please just call your mother and tell her. He, he told me what it was, it had something to little family information And I promised him I would. And his voice started getting faint. And he said, we need to hang up. And I said, I don't want to hang up. And this whole time, my husband is pestering me. Who is it? Who is it? Who is it? And I said, I don't want to hang up. And I got teary. And his voice was getting fainter and fainter. And he said, this takes a tremendous amount of energy. And I need to to hang up now. But I will call you again, and you just need to remember the love that you felt when you were here. And as soon as we hang up, you'll feel it again. And with that, he hung up, and as soon as the connection was disconnected, our bedroom filled with, it looked like smoke, but there was no smell. Um, it was like a just a water vapor, but it was very dense. And, you know, under normal circumstances, if the bedroom fills with smoke and you've got children, you get up, you run, get your kids, and you get out of the house. But neither one of us moved. And our bed was situated such that we could see straight down the hall from our bedroom. And at the end of the hall, I saw a red light. It was like a laser pointer light. And that light, when I saw that light, it just flooded me with the love that I had felt in the garden. It it was overwhelming. Um, but it was like being in the garden where the light and the colors carried the love. And here it was happening again. And Instantly, the, that water vapor or whatever it was dissipated. It was all clear and we're both sitting there stunned. And my husband said, who was on the phone? And I said, did you just see anything? And he said, what smoke? (laughs) (laughs) Okay. Um, He said, tell me who was on the phone. 
And I said, my grandfather. And he said, which one? And I told him. And he said, mm, I'm going to sleep. <laughs> and that was it. And we never discussed it after that. And it wasn't until 21 years later, we were in Jerusalem for the rabbinic ordination of our son. And we had traveled there independently with our current spouses. And we were at a celebration dinner for our son. And his name is Andy, our son. And Andy said to his dad, do you remember a phone call mom got one night from her grandfather? I had told my kids about this periodically over the years. I would tell them at, once they were older. And he said, I do remember it. And I completely stopped the conversation I was having with someone else and tuned into that across the table because we had never discussed it. And Andy said to his dad, what happened? And he proceeded to tell him every detail, every detail, down to the smoke and the red light and all of it. And it, it was it was stunning to me that here we are 21 years later, and he's he remembered every detail, but he never talked about it. And I didn't feel like I could talk about it. So it had been buried. Well, that's a very dramatic paranormal experience. It's after death communication, I guess. Um, yeah, very dramatic. Mm -hmm. Very dramatic. And I wish he would call me again. <laughs> he hasn't on the phone. But we don't have landlines anymore, so I don't know if that has something to do with it. I don't. It, it's hard to say, but now that I think about it, it reminds me a little bit of the briefest experience I had. I discussed it uh, in in my speech last oh, night. Yes. In in which Uncle Harry. Another. Well, this would be Elizabeth Targ. Oh, oh, yeah. I you know was dreaming of yes. Elizabeth Targ Absolutely. who had died. And uh, just as I'm telling her in the dream, I'm so excited about all your communications, especially the physical ones. Ring, ring. The phone rings. I pick it up. Just white noise. But maybe if I had been a little more sensitive, I would have heard her voice in the white noise. You know what, Jeff? After I discussed this with Jeff Kripal when we were working on our book, mm -hmm. he said to me, if you had handed the phone to your husband, what would he have heard? Good question. And immediately I knew the answer. I said he would have heard white noise. Same yeah. thing. And I knew that's what he would have heard. Uh -huh. I heard my grandfather's voice. So there's something to it, and it's all, it all has to do with energy. If I had been struck by lightning, I might have been able to hear more. <laughs> I don't know if it's worth it. I don't know. <laughs> well, you had to uh, recover from the burns. I did. And uh, people who recover from near-death experiences often have broken bones and yeah, you know sure. very severe problems. Right. I mean, it, some trauma causes you to be near death. Mm-hmm. Uh, you know, so, yeah, there's usually physical ramifications. Yeah, the recovery from that can can be painful and difficult for sure. But in your case, you did recover, and the unfolding of your life subsequent to a near-death experience 33 years ago, I'm guessing it's still ongoing. Yes. So is the physical recovery. That's never complete either. Um, I, I have scars on my feet um, from where the lightning left my body. And also, uh, about three years ago, so this is 30 years after the lightning strike, I started having trouble with my vision in my right eye. And I went to the eye doctor. I had no idea what was going on. They examined me, and he said, 
have you ever been electrocuted? And I said, why do you ask? And he said, because your retina looks burned. And he said, and that's very common as a delayed response to an electrocution, which I didn't know. (laughs) So it's still ongoing. Um, Actually, I'm a member of a lightning strike support group on Facebook. And um, it's, it's amazing how many different physical problems people have years after, decades after a lightning strike. So, yeah, the physical part. And it's very rare. I imagine less than one person in a million is ever struck by lightning. When the lottery gets struck by lightning, I get struck by lightning. <laughs> you know, the odds are about the same. So what are some of the other things that have unfolded for you over time? Obviously, writing a book. I, I have, I have um, precognition. You know, I don't know if it's due to the near-death experience or being electrocuted. I, I don't know, and I guess it doesn't really matter. Um, but I think it's a fairly common uh, after effect for NDEs. Well, since you're part of the Lightning Stripe group on Facebook. Yeah, they don't talk about that. But I do have precognitive, usually dreams. I mean, it's happened a couple of times when I'm awake, but usually it's when I'm asleep. I think my defenses are down and I allow more in when I'm sleeping, obviously. Um, and it's usually um, precognition about disasters, plane crashes and tsunamis and earthquakes, um, which is, you know, some are man-made plane crashes. Some are act of God, nature. uh, And it's very unpleasant, very unpleasant. And I email them to myself as soon as they happen and I wake up. I email them. That's how I know it's one of those nightmares because when it's a normal dream or a nightmare, I, as soon as I wake up, it's gone. I can't remember it, but these, I can't forget them. So I email it to myself. So it's date and time stamped. And then when it happens a day or two later, it's just confirming for me. It, it kind of makes me feel like I'm not losing my mind. <clears throat> you know, I did know that was going to happen. And and then it happens. And it, it's horrible. Um, except there was one that wasn't so horrible. I, My current husband and I were on vacation, and I had one of those nightmares, and I grabbed the laptop. I woke up and grabbed the laptop and I'm typing out what it was to send it to myself. And he woke up and he said, oh, did you have a nightmare? Because he knows that's what I do. I said, yeah. And he said, what was it? And I told him, I said, it was an airplane. It was a big passenger jet and it's sitting on water, like in a river. And people are standing on the wings. And he said, oh, uh, you may have missed on this one because planes float like a rock. <laughs> you know, they, they don't sit on the water. And I said, I know, but that's what it was. And the next morning we were in our hotel restaurant having breakfast and he was facing the TV and they had the news. I think it was CNN was on and he started choking and pointing. He said, look, look. And I turned around, and there was the picture of the landing on the Hudson, mm-hmm. Captain Sully, yes. um, and and everyone survived. So that was not a tragedy, but I did know it. I it I had the nightmare seven and a half hours. With the time change, it was seven and a half hours later that it happened. 
So it's not as if you could have done anything. Exactly. Exactly. And what am I going to do? I mean, first of all, if it's an act of God or nature, there's nothing I can do. But if it's a plane crash, I can't really call the FAA and say, this plane is going to crash because then when it happens, they're going to look at me and say, what did you do to that plane? Or, you know, what I don't, I don't think I'm supposed to do that. Plus, it doesn't happen every time I have one of these nightmares mm -hmm. because people have free will. And if there's a screw loose on an airplane, it could be that a mechanic finds it and tightens it before the plane takes off. And then it doesn't crash. So I, I don't. So well, what percentage would you say of these dreams work out? We looked into that for our book. Um, so Jeff took, Jeff Kripal took all of my emails and gave them to uh, one of his grad students and said, look up all of these disasters and see how many you can find. I want to know what percentage of them are accurate. And he found about 50%. So my feeling is probably the percentage is higher because why would I get the information if it wasn't going to happen? Why? Okay. And a lot of them are small little things that wouldn't necessarily be in the news. Like a helicopter crashes in Taiwan. He may not find that on the internet. Sure. You know, two people died. And so it could be that there were other things that I was accurate on. It's not always big planes, mm -hmm. um, but so it's, I would say, greater than 50%, but I don't know how much. You were explaining to me a little earlier that the nightmares are diminishing in frequency over time. Only since I wrote the book. Mm -hmm. uh, I think that I was supposed to get this out there. I was supposed to tell the story. And once I did that, they, they started slowing down. I used to have one or two a month. And now I would say I have one every four to six months. So it's much better. Given that maybe 50% of them are easily identifiable and accurate, and we're talking about events that, to be conservative, one would not expect to happen less than 1% at the time, right. maybe one thousandth of 1% of, of the time, it raises the question, why is this happening at all to you? Is there a purpose? Do you know the answer? <laughs> No, because I, I would love to know. I would think a person like Jeffrey Kripal might have some thoughts about it. He does have thoughts about it. Um, he feels, and I tend to agree with him because I don't have any other explanation. Um, it was intended as an attention-getting device to get my attention, um, to... To not to tell me it wasn't the information that, you know, TWA flight 800 is going to crash, which it did. Um, it's not the facts of the case that I'm supposed to be getting. It's the fact that I can know that it's going to happen before it happens. Mm -hmm. And I kept fighting that. And now that I don't fight it anymore, I guess the powers that be don't feel the need to get my attention so much. Well, your experiences, both the precognitive dreams and the two weeks uh, in the afterlife, which really transpired over, I don't know, 20 minutes. Mm, no, maybe two minutes. Two minutes be be before they came and rescued you right. from the parking lot. Exactly. And, uh, both of those events suggest that there's something about the nature of time 
itself that we need to be paying attention to. Absolutely. I, I don't understand it. I've never studied physics. I mean, my background is very, I have an undergraduate degree in business and went to law school, and that's my education. I, I, physics is difficult for me. I will say when I was there in the garden during the NDE, I understood it completely. I got it. There was no question. Uh, but now it's really difficult for me. Mm-hmm. You're right. Uh, time is not linear. We we need to understand this. Yeah. Uh, actually, <laughs> um, I had a very upset. I wrote about this in my essay, actually. There was a nightmare that I had. It's the only time this has happened. Uh, and it, we did not put it in our book because there were survivors that we didn't want to upset. But for the essay, I put it in there, and I changed the names and dates and all the identifying information. This was different because I was on the plane that was going to crash. Usually I just see it, and then that picture, whatever it is I saw, will appear on the news. A broken bridge and a car's hanging over, and and I can see the license plate number on the car, and that picture will appear on the news. But this was different. This was, I'm on the plane, and I was talking to a passenger. She told me her name. She introduced me to her child, who was sitting next to her, told me his name. Uh, And all this was in my email to myself after I woke up. And the plane um, started to bank really hard and then was kind of wobbling, and everyone knew. And, you know, there was bedlam in that cabin. Things were flying through the cabin, including people who had not been buckled in. And she had grabbed onto my forearms, and I knew I needed to open my eyes and wake up. And it was becoming pretty critical. I needed to open my eyes and wake up. And as long as she had a grip on me, I couldn't. It, it was like I, I couldn't wake up. And she was screaming at me, screaming at me to take her child. She knew I could leave. And she wanted me to take her little boy with me. And she said, my husband's name is, and she told me his name. And she said, um, he... He took a different flight with our daughter because we never fly together in case something happens. And I couldn't take the little boy. And then there was a jolt and I woke up and I was crying and I emailed it to myself immediately. And it was different in that, number one, I was on the plane. And number two, it was happening as I was dreaming it. When when it hit the news, there were no survivors. It was a huge jumbo jet, and there were no survivors. And <laughs> the time, it was a different time zone, but when you adjust it for the Houston mm-hmm. Central Time, it was happening at the same time. It happened about two minutes before I hit send on the email. Mm. So... Um, It was in real time. And what I was going to say about time is I was at Esalen um, a a few years ago, and I met Whitley Strieber. And we became friends. And I had told Whitley about this particular nightmare, how upsetting it was to me. And he said, well, what part of it was so upsetting? And I said, well, the fact that I knew I could leave and I knew all these people couldn't leave. And this woman who I had felt like I had been at a cocktail party with her, we were making small talk, you know, about our lives and and she couldn't leave. And he said, Elizabeth, you told me that time isn't linear. I said, correct. It's simultaneous. I mean, everything happens at once. He said, 
So that plane crash happened, but it's still happening, and it'll happen again. I said, yeah, probably. And he said, so go back and give her some comfort. You can go back and give her comfort and let her know that her consciousness is going to live on. Just because this plane crashes, it's not the end of her or her son. Now, if I can figure out how to get back, he's right. He's completely correct because time is not linear. I should be able to go back and do that. I just can't figure out how. Well, since it was in a dream, and and a dream is not really under the control of the conscious mind, not likely to be through a conscious process. Right. So, subconsciously, can I do it? I I don't know how. Well, through self-hypnosis. Maybe. Maybe. A a meditative process, a guided visualization. It would have to be guided because I... When I try Mm -hmm. to do these myself, I fall asleep. Mm -hmm. So it would have to be guided, and I would be willing to try, Mm -hmm. um, although it was very unpleasant being on a plane that was crashing. You know, there might be an opening there for you if you worked with a a, a guy. I mean, it's the sort of thing that in my old psychotherapeutic days, I would guide people through experiences. I know how to do that. Someday we, you know... I would love to. You could possibly do that with me or with someone who has a similar background. It could be, it could be done because my, my intuition here is that these experiences are beckoning you in some way. Right. Right. And it would definitely help explain a lot to me about the nature of time Mm -hmm. if I'm able to do that. And it wouldn't even be just for you. It would be for people who learn about it. Right, exactly. I think the human community is awakening to these possibilities. Your experience so. is is exemplary of, of what any human being might be capable of. Well, that's the thing. I think everyone's capable of it. Mm-hmm. You just have to be open to it yeah. and aware of it. And I should think, for example, I'm betting that as a result of your book, you've heard from other people who say things like, uh, I know just what you're talking about because I've had similar experiences. Yeah, Yeah, many, many people. Many people. And if if people, you know, parapsychologists know this all the time. When we talk, people come up. And I'm sure you've had the same experience. They People say, I want to tell you about my experience. And they always preface it by saying, I've never told anybody else before. It's <laughs> true. Very true. But if we had a culture in which people could talk openly about these experiences, it might accelerate the evolution of humanity. It would. If you didn't risk losing your credibility, Mm -hmm. and you didn't risk losing your livelihood, your career, if you're a doctor or, or, you know, if you're a medical doctor, it it would be difficult to to discuss these things. Mm -hmm. Uh, But I wish we could. Well, I suspect that um, the Bigelow competition, which is why we're here together today in Las Vegas, is an event that can accelerate the public discussion. I, I hope it does. I mean, yeah. I think that was the goal of Robert Bigelow mm-hmm. was to, uh, you know, start a conversation, a legitimate conversation about these things that um, in, in you know, he brought together great minds. Mm-hmm. I mean, at that award ceremony last night, that was the brain power in that room was phenomenal. And these are top researchers that that should be able to have legitimate conversations. And I, I hope that Bigelow continues what he started. It's already giving us an occasion to have this conversation with each other in person, (laughs) face to face. Last time we did this, it was over Skype. Right. Right. This is much better. Yeah. And 
I encourage our viewers to share this sort of material. I think the Bigelow competition is giving uh, what I do on YouTube greater visibility. And uh, at some point, there's going to be a critical mass of, of people who are having these conversations. And that could result potentially in a paradigm shift for the whole culture. I really hope you're right. I don't know how long it will right, take. Right, right, but mm -hmm. I do think it'll happen. Yeah. I mean, look at society today versus 30 years ago. Well, there's the paradox because we live in a, a linear realm. Right. We would exactly. say 30 years ago seems like a long time ago, but from what you're telling me, no, it's, it's now. actually it's now. Right now. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> and that is mind-boggling. Yeah. How could it, it be is. 30 years ago and now at the same time? That's why it's so difficult for me. I mean, that's I don't have that ability to understand. I know that it's a fact. Mm -hmm. I Intellectually, I know that it's right now, and it's tomorrow, and it's 100 years from now. You know, I know that. Yeah. I just can't grasp it. Of course, you know, to the extent that our ego mind is here in the physical reality, we uh, operate according to, or, or operate isn't quite the right word, we incorporate the rules of physical reality. Most people are accustomed to thinking in terms of clock time. Right. Exactly. Exactly. I mean, and we mark time, you know, like, happy birthday. <laughs> it was your birthday yesterday. Uh -huh. and, and it was a great birthday gift you got, by yeah. the way. Yeah. Um, but, yeah, that's clock time. That's marking time. Mm -hmm. And it's just not the way it really is. Well, and, and the way it really is, I guess the best word to put it is transcendent. It transcends all of our logical categories of, of being physical beings inside of this movie. But at, at another level, at a deeper level of what we might, we might call the self with a capital S, right. we, uh, we wrote the movie. Right. We're the director and the producer. And <laughs> exactly. Speaking of movies, there is one movie that does address the issue of time and the nonlinear nature of it, mm -hmm. and they do it beautifully. And I, I suggest that anyone interested in it uh, go rent the movie Arrival because it is. Phenomenal. Yes, it's one of my favorite yes. science fiction movies. Because it's beautiful. I, it's that's it. In mm -hmm. a nutshell, that movie. It, portrays time yep. correctly. Like, wh when I saw the movie, I immediately went home and called Jeff Kripal. We were working on our book, and I said, Jeff, you've got to see this movie. I'm going to go back with you. We have mm -hmm. to go see it today. Mm -hmm. I was so excited, and he did go see it the next day, mm -hmm. and he called me, and he said, they got it right. They got it right. Mm -hmm. They did. And and if I recall correctly, and this is a movie uh, uh, about a female scientist. Uh, no, she's a linguist. A linguist. Mm -hmm. That's right. She encounters a male scientist, a physicist. Correct. The two of them get to know each other. They have a child, and she's already looking into the future. She knows her child will die. Right, right. It's Amy Adams is the actress. Beautiful actress. Gorgeous, gorgeous yeah. movie. It really is. And then you have these extraterrestrials who understand the nature yeah, of time. They, they squirt this ink. They're like yeah. some kind of squids or something. They call them heptapods. That's me right. Meaning That's right. they have seven legs. They're like giant octopi mm -hmm. with, with seven. And the intelligence mm -hmm. and their reason for being here was was time related mm -hmm. that they were going to save humanity no that humanity needed to help save them 3000 years in the future yeah. and 
it, it was wonderful. And Amy Adams' character, who is a linguist, learns to decode their language. In the process of decoding their language, she gains this precognitive ability in, in which there's flashes in the movie. She sees this child who is even, is not even born yet right. and realizes that She's going to marry the physicist. They're going to have a well, child. Well, not only has the child not been born yet, yeah. the child has been born and has died yeah. and has yet to be born. Beautifully yeah. written. I totally That's concur. Right. But it takes a movie like that to take these very, very difficult ideas and, and bring them to life. In a way that people can understand. Mm -hmm. And the, I can't explain it. But I can point to that movie and say, that's it, mm -hmm. that they got it. That in a sense, it's more than mere science fiction. Mm -hmm. And I, I know, I remember when the movie first came out, the parapsychology community was a buzz. Really? Yes. Wow. People wow. in the parapsychology well, community I can understand why. thought that this this movie yeah, had a, a, an essential handle on something that we've been grasping for. Definitely. Well, Elizabeth, we've had a delightful conversation. Once we have. Again. We have. It's a real pleasure to be with you in person this Thank time. Thank you. We should do this again sometime. <laughs> yeah. I hope we have an occasion to do it. You, of course, are always welcome to come to Albuquerque, and <laughs> where I have a little studio, and who knows? I may come to Albuquerque. I have family, actually, in Santa Fe. That, that'll be delightful, because I know you have much more to reveal. I do. I do. Thank you. Thank you so and much. And congratulations. Thank you. <laughs> Big congratulations. Thank you. It's been a very special time for me. I know it has been. But I can say, and this is, since we're discussing it, a very strange thing for me. I knew well in advance of the announcement of this award, without any doubt, that, I, that it, it felt to me months ago like this uh, honoring of my essay uh, had already happened. It did. Even before I finished writing it. It did. It did. Yeah. That, there it is, in a nutshell. Yeah. I, it happened, and and I couldn't tell anyone, of course, because right. it would have it would have been inappropriate. Right, <laughs> right. So it happened before. Yeah, it's going to happen again. <laughs> it's quite an interesting phenomenon, and I I wish I could have the eloquence to to put it into words in, in a better way. Me too. Yeah. <laughs> it's very frustrating. Well, Elizabeth, thank you so much for coming here and, and being with me in this hotel room today. And Thank you for having me. Mm -hmm. It's been a pleasure. And for those of you watching or listening, thank you for being with us. <laughs>